Afternoon, everyone. My name is Judith. I'm Head of Government Relations and Education and Chair of the BFC Colleges Council. Welcome. Um, we've already had two sessions this morning. For those of you who were at those, apologies. My introduction is the same at every session, but just wanted to highlight to everyone that this session forms part of our Graduate Preview Day. Um, and each year, the Graduate Preview allows industry professionals to access portfolios from the graduating fashion talent that's emerging from our incredible fashion colleges. And our purpose is to really foster the relationship between educators, graduates, and the industry. Um, I'm hoping that the link will be um, in the chat for you to go to the Graduate Preview website and have a look at the incredible portfolios that are on that link. As well as profiling the top talent to industry and beyond, the Graduate Preview is running a series of events to support students with tips and knowledge about how to take their next steps into the industry, whether it's insights on getting your first job or need to know advice for when you're setting up a fashion business. Um, the students will hear from top industry professionals, such as those, um, those joining us in today's session, on the do's and don'ts when entering the world of work. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the session now, which is Are You Employment Ready? Um, which is led by a close BFC friend, uh, Emma Davidson, who is the Managing Director of Denza. And she's joined by Lucy Salter, another close friend of the BFC, Talent Acquisition Manager at PVH Corp, Tommy Hilfiger and Calvin Klein. And Oliver, new friend of the BFC, um, who's Design Manager at A Cold Wall. Thank you all for joining us. We look forward to your tips and knowledge about those next steps into the industry. I'd just like to tell everyone who's on the call to make sure you submit your questions to the chat. Um, we'd love to bring you on live. Um, we're going to sort of turn to questions at about 1.40. So we'd love to have you um, on live to ask your questions and make the session really interactive. I think that's enough for me if everyone's... Okay, I'm ready to start our handover. Emma, take it away. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. And it's such a pleasure to be here again. I did a similar talk last year and I had um, other people like me who work as fashion recruitment consultants in the industry. Um, this year, we've got Lucy Salter who works internally for a company doing HR. And we've got Ollie who has a career in design and I thought that they'd be two nice guests to bring on board to between the three of us discuss the different points of view of a graduate and your journey from college entering your new career the thing that you've studied for so maybe Lucy why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself how your job works and um yeah, start there. You might need to tell me how my job works, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> so hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lucy. Uh, I am originally from the UK, but uh, I have actually been working and living in the Netherlands for uh, 14 years. Uh, so a lot of people aren't aware, um, but Tommy Hilfiger's global office is based in Amsterdam and we are the European hub of uh, Kelvin Klein. So I am the talent acquisition manager um, across a lot of different product areas within um, PVH, our holding business. Um, so we, I recruit mainly for fashion design, but I also recruit for merchandisers, buyers, um, product developers, pattern cutters. Um, and I also do a lot of marketing. So the fashion side behind marketing, art directors, anything that basically requires a portfolio sort of hits my field. And recently, because there's been a huge push on e-com, I've also been working across Omnichannel and e-com. Uh, and with that... Crikey. <laughs> just a little bit busy. <laughs> so um, with that, obviously, comes sort of the uh, bricks and mortar side, as well as the e-com, which has been the digital um, bringing in-house uh, uh, an actual e-com platform that was also before COVID was actually outsourced. So all the CEO, CEAs, paper clicks. So not my world at all, but I've been learning. Uh, my true passion <laughs> is really the design and the portfolio driven, but you get, you get thrown in many different, uh, in, in different areas. And I've actually yeah. been at the business uh, just over nine years. Uh, and I'm, would 
really lucky to say that when I joined, it was just Tommy. And I actually helped build Kelvin Klein as what it is today. And I've gone through many different journeys with, with CK. Oh, I'm going to come back and ask you some of those questions in a minute, Lucy. But Oliver Moores, tell me more. <laughs> um... I started my career working for Neil Barra um, as a graduate, working on his diffusion line. But Where we, did you graduate from, Ollie? Northumbria. Northumbria. I'd done four years uh, up in Newcastle. Uh, graduated and moved down here to London, um, initially to intern for Neil. Um, working out of London for his diffusion line for Black Barrett. Um, I did that for two or three years and then I always wanted to kind of go down a, a tailoring route. I wanted to be a cutter to begin with. So it was kind of a dream to go work on Savarone. I worked on there for kind of two and a half years. I moved over there to do the runway, um, to take it from a presentation standpoint to a runway for Hardy Amy's. Um, I worked with the creative director there. Uh, I then moved over back to Neil Barrett, but on his main line as his head of show. And that was for three years. And that was based out in Milan, in Italy. Um, and Pretty was, glamour, high glamour. Yeah, high, high pace. Um, yeah. yeah, drama. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did that out there, were for runway and show with a great team out there for, for kind of three years. And then recently, in the past couple of years, moved back to to London um, and took on the position here as a design manager um, at Coldwall to kind of help them build um, a lot more infrastructure into the team and the design team and production team here. Um, they were acquired by, well, a large percentage um, was acquired by Tomorrow Showrooms to kind of invest in a Coldwall and, and help it build into a larger brand. So I got brought on then within the team to kind of facilitate Fire alarm, sorry. <laughs> Could not have asked for it over this time. Okay. Um, we can cope, don't worry, Ollie. So basically then, my job is at Denza, I'm a headhunter and a recruitment consultant. So I work between Lucy, who would be my client, and she might call me and say, oh, I'm looking for a head of menswear. And then I would have a candidate, like Ollie, who is head of menswear, and I would say, Ollie, are you interested in working for PBH? And then I would like broker the pair of them together, set up introductions, go through portfolios, select the best candidate. And I know that that's a very, very short explanation of kind of how we all work together, mm -hmm. but that's kind of it. You can ask questions at the end about this. Mm -hmm. um, right, so. You must have been involved, Ollie, too, in kind of like people applying an interview process and all that kind of stuff. And obviously you do it, Lucy, every single day. Um, when you receive applications from a candidate, whether it's like looking at their CV or the cover letter or the portfolio, what are the key things that you see as positives and negatives for me it's like when they address the letter to the wrong name and then i just think delete on the email because they haven't bothered doing their research what do you guys think attention to detail is really key i think especially when you're going through the recruitment process and application i can go first i believe that's okay yeah um, yeah <laughs> so people are like banging there straight away. So, uh, for me, um, I think that the first thing I do when I get an application, we obviously have an application tracking system because we're quite a large business, and we on average have about fifteen hundred people apply per day across all of our different roles um, across the wider HR. Um, you don't have to read them all, though, do you, Lucy? Uh, no. But for example, when I'm doing the design ones, what I would do is the first thing I look at would be your portfolio. So before I even view your CV or cover letter, I would look at your book and I would, t I would look to see if it told me a story. So from the concept, the way that your brain thinks and that, that logic of how you've taken that concept to your final product. I love 
I'm not going to. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> so for me, I love to see your brain, but on a two-day PDF, because that's how you can do it within, obviously, an application system. Um, so I really, really enjoy seeing your hand sketches. I really enjoy seeing um, if we've done any draping. I also really enjoy if we've done any technical. So Illustrator, and obviously the world is also turning towards a little bit of 3D. So if you haven't any 3D, that would also be interesting to see. But for me, what's a no-no if you've gone from a concept page to your art-directed final look? That to me doesn't show me anything. And then if they get them pulled in, I would then check your CV. And I look for specific universities. And I really want to be honest, I do think that UK bring out the best fashion universities across the globe. So if there's also somebody there, for example, a different a, a university, I would then potentially also contact my contact at that university just to see what you are, what you are like. <laughs> How you are, my whip, my spy. Uh, and, then, and then I would read your uh, your um, cover letter. So that would be my order. But that's my yeah. my my journey that I go through. What about you, Ollie? How does it, how have things landed on your desk and the I mean, I made, <clears throat> I made a mistake in the past doing some of these talks being like, I, it was about, you know, drive. And when I graduated, I, I did graduate fashion week, which brought slight frustrations to me of I, I want, I didn't feel like my portfolio was getting picked up and I was getting seen and noticed. So I went down to several row and I went knocking on the doors asking for jobs like portfolio in hand. Cause I was just really driven to be, wanting a job and I yeah. made a comment last time and I got about 3,000 Instagram notifications and requests from graduates asking me for a job <laughs> yeah so I, I'm conscious not to drive it too much down that route but when I get when I get a portfolio in through when I've had them at Neil Barrett or, or here at Cold Wall trying to fill positions I think kind of what pretty much what Lucy was saying like I my initial thing is the portfolio I assess the CV after I've looked at the portfolio because I need to know first and foremost that their process, their development process and how they develop work is going to work within how we work as a team here at Cold mm. War. Mm. Whether that be a 3D on a mannequin in person, whether it be on a, a design process like Claude, like the 3D mannequin process, whether it be flat hand sketches, whether it all be illustrator based it's really important because that that book sells to me who you are as a designer and I think that is the most important thing if I if I see a portfolio and it feels generic is the part where I struggle to place you within my team because I need to know you know even if the point of view isn't exactly what we want here at Cold Wall if I know you have one it's more important than it being a whitewash of generic kind of ideas. Yeah. I need to understand who you are within that yeah. kind of 10 to 20 page pot, small portfolio you'd send across to us. And then and, I would go into break down into yeah. CV. And from these two very different sort of ends of entry point, I suppose, to a brand, to a HR, you've both mentioned seeing the portfolio and it being one of the most important things that you see first it's also important to me people applying to be part of our agency if people are applying directly what do you think should I mean obviously don't send your whole portfolio around what do you think the key things are in receiving that like what if they were to send a teaser of their portfolio, should it just be one project? Should it just be something specifically for your brand? Like, what do you think? I've got a good one here, Lucy, but I'll, if you want to go, you, you go first here. Go on, Ollie. Um, the accessibility and ease of viewing that is paramount to me. If I... I've just fallen I, in love with you, Ollie. If I, if I get sent things and I have to... Uh, go through and download a link or it's too large to open or it's a different format and it's for me to be if someone sends me something through if I can click that and it's going to send me through to an either an online portfolio or their own website or something that's easy and quick because I get so many of them 
and I've obviously got all of the work to do during the day. Yeah, you've got a job too. Yeah, it, <laughs> that, that ease of viewing something, it makes it a million times more accessible and you're more likely for me to see it. Could yeah. not agree more. And yeah. I also think that people also need to be aware that if you squash something to make it a size, for example, if you're sending a PDF, don't take away all of the details because <laughs> then it, yeah, you, or you make it too big. It's, so yeah, it's really like that ease to view something from start to finish. So from my point of view, if I were to say to candidates, don't send more than like 10 pages as a teaser of your portfolio, try and make it less than five megabytes so that it can be easily emailed. So it might hit Ollie's inbox and he's like, oh, I know somebody on the team who wants to see that better. He can email it easily. Mm -hmm. It's better just to send something in good quality, small size, PDF attachment, done, rather than like click, trying to click through and download a wee transfer that's 200 megabytes. And yeah. would you both agree? Yeah. Yeah. Because you know what? I love to delete. If it's typical, not that I love to delete, but I've got hundreds of emails to get through. I might have a bossy client, you know, no names mentioned, Lucy. Or I might be trying to look after a candidate like Ollie. And I don't have time. I'm really sorry to be like this, but it's like I don't have time to go through everybody else's email. Make it easy for us because yeah. then we can process it quickly. I had a, but I mean, bearing in mind, like, I feel like I'm, I'm not even that old. I feel like I'm showing my age, but like, you know, we had paper, we had real portfolios yeah. and I went and I had a graduate literally this week, graduate fashion week, hand me a card and on the back of the card, there was a QR code and I scanned it and it took me straight through to their portfolio, their online site that they'd done. And just the ease of that was paramount to ask spent you know 10 minutes kind of scrolling through it because it was easy to get to it, even though she didn't have a portfolio to hand me in person because that wasn't even allowed obviously due to covid restrictions they'd adapted and it was still extremely easy to view things like that are just priceless yeah if you don't know what a qr code is it's that thing we've all been having to scan to register our presence at a at a cafe or a restaurant it takes you to a web link as well Lucy you don't like websites do you I'm not a big fan <laughs> I love the old traditional books and where you flick in and obviously being based in the Netherlands is a little bit more and difficult. also being in your 70s <laughs> <laughs> Botox has been kind to me now <laughs> I'm joking no um but I, I find it sometimes difficult to view a, a, a web page because you're trying to cram so much on there and it might be that you don't it doesn't take me through the journey and the order that you want to present yourself so I can easily swap and change and I don't I love I'm a feeler I love that texture I love to see the fabrics the colors the trims which obviously via a website makes it a little bit more difficult and also now presenting via virtual because we've had nobody flown over for any interviews now for 18 months so it's how you actually get that tactileness in a portfolio is incredibly difficult at the moment uh, i don't as a recruiter having one website as a portfolio i find really difficult because different brands have a different aesthetic and you've put all your projects online you might have three women's wear, two men's wear, and you're applying for a men's wear job. I can't send the link showing the women's wear because a client doesn't want to see that. They just want to see your men's wear work. So that is probably the biggest letdown about a website. Um, a lot of people will just say, oh, my work's on my website. And I really insist on, can I have a PDF so that we can edit it? and tailor it specifically for a client because every application should be specifically for that client. So if it was going to go to Ollie at a Cold War, different work than it would be for Tommy, than it would be for, I can't, can't think, than it would be for, you know, like Roxander or a different brand. You wouldn't send the same work to every client. You would edit your CV 
you would edit your cover letter and you would edit the portfolio. Um, right. Anyone got anything else to say on the matter of portfolio? I could talk for hours, but maybe not. <laughs> I think it's also important to see, uh, still have that diverse hand. So for example, I know for example, when you're just graduating, you have very much what your university has set you out, but I would also expect for you to work on your own projects as well. So not necessarily just your graduation piece. You need to show that because you're very much your design work, but then it might not be for me. I'm super commercial background with the Tommy and the Calvin. So I need to see some commercial side of your portfolio rather than you being as free and as uh, creative as you can possibly be. So I, I need to be able to juggle the between the two, if that makes sense. Yeah, hundred percent. I could not agree more. I've within my personal portfolio as well, I have tried to tackle it in that manner through graduation and even up to where I am now. I mean, within the types of brands that I've worked in from Hardy Amy's, which is Savile Row traditional tailoring to now a cold wall, which is purebred street wear, I've had to have myself adapt to what those brands are and show that I can work within those. Therefore, each part of my portfolio is very different from each other so mm. it shows that I can work across different types of brands but still bring my own opinion to those brands whether yeah, it be yeah. a more commercial or a high-end and it's really important to show diversity within it and I've also got a project in there always that is 100% me nothing to do with any of the brands I once had that fed back to me in an interview that the work I had in my portfolio was extreme. It was when I left Neil before I came to Call Wall and it was the things in there were very Neil Barrett. And it kind of struck a chord with me, which was, I, I, you know, I can design that kind of product, but that's not necessarily me 100% as a designer. So I found myself doing a project that showed exactly what I was like and exactly what I liked. And those were the projects that actually got me the jobs further down the line as opposed to what I'd done in the past. Sorry, got another cat visit. <laughs> um, I agree with that as well. Graduates may have left having done women's wear, for example, but there's always things inside somebody's portfolio that I look at that could possibly diversify what they do. So if somebody's particularly strong at color and pattern, I would suggest why not adding print portfolio pages to, to their, um, yeah, to their portfolio or exploring other kind of avenues to what they already do. If somebody comes to me and they said, I've done women's wear, but I want to do men's wear and there's none of it in their book, I'm like, good luck with that that's something else you would need to do projects and I always think think about the job that you want next if you don't have any work for that in your book then that's when you should be doing personal projects and I know everybody including people who already have a job not just you poor graduates the last year and a half has truly sucked and I hope that you've had found the like personal energy to to continue working on you know personal projects and keep going you don't have to materialize them by constructing garments they can just be um mood inspiration research development and illustrations at the end it, you don't need to have like created a whole um what's the word collection that you've made yourself although some people have i've seen mm -hmm. okay what about setting projects as part of the interview process <laughs> tell us ollie you must have done one or two <laughs> in your life <laughs> oh god this is such a bone of contention because i when doing them detest them but also see the absolute need and importance of them on being on the receiving end of them you know when hiring staff because I've, you know, the girl I've, I've just employed into our team here at a cold wall, her handwriting was beautiful and was amazing and her work was great. But I needed her to do a project. 
to understand that she could translate her hand into what we needed here, which she did, and she absolutely knocked it out of the park. But I needed for I her. I knew that was it wasn't through me, but I know who it was. I know she, who it was. <laughs> She's awesome. The the thing was, in order for me to understand that she understood what we needed. I needed a short project and I was really open and candid with that. You know, I didn't want a 20 look all cutted up piece collection. I was like, take three garments, explore them for me and just show me what you would do with those three garments around the three kind of personas we were looking at within the brand. And yeah. she went out of the park and it kind of sold it to, you know, it was 10, 15 pages long, wasn't massive, but told me everything I needed to know. Yeah. And that's not just for graduates, is it Lucy? No. We have everybody do a project that end. Yeah, it was part of the interview process as part of PVH. How so senior? Think, how senior would you make somebody do a project? Even our chief design officer did a project. Wow. So yeah, everybody um, within the business, and it's not necessarily designing sketches by hand. It's like, how would you brief based on this concept? So it's really is completely different. Dif different, but even if you're a merchant you would also need to work on a project. Mm -hmm. How analytical you are, how you actually pull that data. So it can be completely, yeah, really, really, really different uh, depending on for what role you're going for. Yeah, there's a couple of tips that I would give um, anyone who's being asked to do a project is get it in writing, double check the delivery date, make sure that you can meet it and that the client has set one and that you can meet it. If you can't, let them know immediately and say, I'm not able to do this date and propose a second one. Um, read the brief again. And if there's nothing, if there's any like tiny little thing that you have a doubt about, ask. Um, because you're kind of setting yourself up to fail because it's not just what's in the project to complete, it's also, can you meet a deadline? Can you communicate a difficulty? Are you able to ask more questions? All these things around the project are really important too, in my opinion. Would you agree, Lucy? Completely, and I think for me, because I work for two quite large brands, if you're gonna put a logo on a project, make sure it's the right logo. So, <laughs> or that you don't compress it so much you don't even know what that logo is so obviously Does that happen a lot, Does that happen a lot? honestly obviously we have tommy hilfiger as in the main sportswear brand and we also have tommy jeans you would not believe how many projects i receive for tommy mainline that has a tommy jeans logo on and i'm like come on like they're very different brands very different aesthetics so if you can't even get the logo right what are you going to do? And the same with Kelvin Klein with the, the, the more luxury line. And then we have the CK jeans. And the, and also, especially on the accessories part as well, because lo lo logos are very important that you use the most up-to-date one you can find rather than just one that um, you think can be, you can see maybe five, 10, 20 years ago because brands also update their logos. <laughs> do you think that's because a candidate hasn't um, researched the company well enough I don't know, but it's, it's, it's really, and when we go through that interview process, when we set that project, we are very clear who the project's for. So it's just something very small. And I also would advise that we never ask for people to send their projects digitally. Um, that for me is really super scary. It's your work. We used to fly people over to present their portfolio their projects in person we are unable to do that because of covid so we ask for you to share your screen via a web a webex or a, a, a zoom call but we never ask for you to send over your projects digitally so have you had to do that before ollie what was that send are you answering work emails at the same time no 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 <laughs> I wouldn't blame you, mate. I wouldn't no, blame no, you. No, no. How no. do you feel about having to send work via email? Um, I mean, it. I think it depends on who I'm sending it to. Yeah. On the type of brand that I'm sending it to as to whether I have a degree of trust mm. within who I'm dealing with. I think it also, I mean, you know, recently with yourself, Emma, like that, 
I've sent projects across and I'm dealing through you. So there's yeah. an, an, a degree of safety within that, that I know that nothing's going to be compromised because I trust you and those brands with that work. Um, Careful, if, my head's going to explode in a minute. <laughs> it is It is slightly different, you know, when you come to smaller, maybe niche brands that could, you know, take advantage, especially of graduates. Uh, you know eager graduates that I, I would say to be to be careful with I think it's a really good point to not be private with your work but just be cautious of, of who or you maybe are. maybe just have this small selection like I was saying like the portfolio teaser that you're okay to send around but you just haven't shared your soul with everybody and you've got nothing left to talk about at an interview yeah yeah exactly yeah um when graduates if they're lucky enough to get an interview other than talking through the project other than talking you through their cv what are the kind of things that you are looking for like what do you want to get out of them even if they're unspoken um me personally i just i want to know that there's that they have drive I want to get a good idea from that talking to them that they first of all under, also understand what they are talking about outside of a project that they are soaking up information because also from a graduate stage you know for the first however many years of I mean I'm still learning now I'm still you know I don't know everything I think it's really important for graduates and within the first few years, especially of, of your positions and jobs, that you just soak everything up and learn everything you can and ask as many questions as you can to then have that knowledge to action it later on down in your career because you then know that information. You're not learning it anymore. And when I interview either graduates or, you know, graduates that have had a couple of years into work, I want to know that they are dealing with work in that way that they're trying to be driven and collect information and learn mm -hmm. as they're working and not be afraid to ask questions yeah it's that curiosity yeah yeah they really need to and make sure you always ask questions during an interview yeah we expect you to ask questions and you what should kind of questions do you want them to be asking obviously not how much holiday do i get and yeah, what's oh, the salary yeah. never ask <laughs> I also think to you, but I think a good not question to ask is like, so am I the owner candidate? Who else is in the interview process? Can you give oh. me that? I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think what's for me is really important is it to show that curiosity about the team. Who can actually mentor them? Who can they learn from? Mm -hmm. We're really lucky within PVH. We have a, a a real diverse um, skill sets of people. Some people come from the luxury mar market, some come from a retail background, some come from a more of a premium background. So you can learn from all of these people that we have pulled together. And we're also really super amazing that we have over 75 different nationalities within our umbrella. So you can also learn from different cultures and that you want to grow in different ways. And we have a real big thing that you can also have that internal mobility within PVH as well. Can it be from either brand, but also we have other brands in the US. So I think that's also, they show that they want to be curious with us. And for you, Ollie, you've worked at much smaller companies where the teams have been, I guess, 20 or less. And um, what could be the kind of questions that they could ask you? Is it things like, do the teams go out for a drink after work even, or is that too, what do you think? No, it is. It is. It's important to know that their personalities, because when you, you know, when you're in a smaller group as well, and you you are all working so closely together, and I mean to be totally frank, you're taking on more work than your job describes you doing. You know, it means that you all have to work so much closer together and have such good communication because nothing can afford to be kind of dropped because you're all handling so many things outside of your remit. It's really important for me to know that those people are good communicators and are not afraid to ask questions. And what I can... if I was a cat lover with a big mouth? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you know, oh, like, sorry. I think we always like within the, within the, our business. I always say, could I travel an eight hour flight with this person? Oh, great! Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. They always they was like, could I see myself sit next to this person? I would love to be on a plane, let alone for eight hours. So, like, I think that was something like have you got that connection with yes within the drive and the motivation and the curiosity but also is there a connection there and i think that's what makes it during the interview process you need to get you across as well you are yeah. that person um, because also sorry, in those, you know, when you when you finished say a, a big meeting or a design brief or you've been going through designs it's always that kind of five to 10 minute conversation after those that happen where you almost get the most out of the conversation and guaranteed those conversations always happen with the designers that are proactive and chatty and quite, you know, want to discuss more and more ideas with you and have that discussion. It comes in that little conversation at the end, which doesn't happen with all everybody there and all the designers. So I think that kind of, again, that chatty communication thing is really big. Um, if someone's not naturally chatty and they're like a slow burn, what advice would you give those people going into the interview process? Let your work speak for yourself, themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe prepare, oh, of course, prepare yeah. some questions or... Uh I've had people, I've had candidates come back to me with the questions after the interview, which I'm, I'm fine with because it actually showed me that they were proactive in chasing, you know, what they wanted and had still had questions because me and myself, I mean, you know, I'm quite chatty, but I, I, when I have time to digest things, I find myself having more questions. Yeah, I can confirm I this about you, Ollie. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind candidates coming back and asking those questions, uh, you know, later on, because it still shows me that they're thinking about it as opposed mm -hmm. to just leaving it and, and not affronting the questions at all. But then, Lucy, in a corporation like yours, that probably doesn't work. No, I always ask, obviously, do you have to like the questions? And I always think it's really important that they're also clear on the interview process as well. So if they don't ask that, I expect a candidate to ask that, what is the process during this um, interview? And if they don't come, I give that. And then I always say, if you think of any questions, please make sure you reach out. You have my contact details, you have my mobile number. And I sort of would like them to chase me up as well, because it also shows that they're keen. Um, but. I, yeah, it's, it, I think it's different depending on obviously what level you're also working with. Yeah. yeah. Um, I thought of a really good question then, and now I can't remember. No, we're not going to hire you, Emma. <laughs> oh, no. I... you, can, you can email me later, Emma. It's okay, fine. yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, can, I, can I just also say, I think it's also okay to show that you've prepared and also have that notebook write the questions, get it out during the interview process, because it, if it is a face-to-face, -face, which I'm missing face-to-face -face contact, but like, so for example, if it's on a virtual, you can have that notebook in front of you. You can reflect down to it. It doesn't make it a bad interview. It doesn't make yeah. it a bad conversation. You could even take fake notes because you're, you're um, writing things down and you look so engrossed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can't see. No, no one's going <laughs> to have to see. Um, so graduates won't have had the internships or they won't have had the kind of same experience that they would have had a couple of years ago because of COVID. It's also changed with Brexit, with people being able to um, work internationally. Young people, British people, are going to need to have a visa to go overseas. That's kind of like by the by right now because of COVID. If people were going to be putting alternate experience on their CVs, for example, that they'd been doing volunteering, that maybe they'd been working in a local cafe, that they had been, I don't know, supporting in a local office or something, is any of this interesting to you or you'd rather see additional personal projects in a portfolio? What do you want to do? What would you suggest? I think... I would ask, especially now, because obviously there has been that quite a large period of time when nothing moved. What have they done during that time? So I know, for example, when I moved to the Netherlands and I was looking for a job, I was like, I'm a boxer. 
boxes because I just relocated. So you need to fill that space for sure. Just don't leave it blank. But I think for me, it's um, how have they been creative? I think also, yeah, volunteer work is super relevant, but also if there was a retail side, maybe you did some courses, maybe you did some life drawing to how you kept going, keeping that creativity as part of you. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important. Because I often say if people don't have much more than retail experience, yes, you can put the retail experience on there, but we don't want to know how you had keys to lock up the shop. You mm. could be describing about what you learned about fit, about fabrics, about what customers like, different body shapes, something relevant at least to design if that's what they're looking for or different if it was for merchandising or something. I don't know. What do you think, Ollie? But you're not you're not bothered. No, no, yeah. I'm, Unless they serve I'm, pints. No, when I <laughs> when I was the same, when I was graduating out of um, Northumbria, I was working in flannels um just to earn money before I kind of moved down to London and was applying for if people don't know flannels, it's like a premium luxury level store up north, right? Yeah. They've just started to open up actually down in London and down in the, the southeast. They've like a smaller version of Selfridges, maybe like Browns. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. More in line with Browns, yeah. Um, and I was working there as a sales assistant, but I also started to put together looks um, for the window, VMing, looking how I would put them together, putting them together on the guys in the store. I photographed it all, took photos just to keep myself occupied within clothing before I had that six month period before when I moved down to London because I wanted to keep myself active doing something that I felt was correct for me to be doing and yeah. at the same time so. yeah yeah I can see that we've got um Judith's little face has popped up in the, in the corner <laughs> there hi Judith hi back in the kitchen gonna make us a cake Anyone want a cup of tea or a demo? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm back because I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to grill you all and give you some, some questions. There's a couple already that have come through. Um, one about, if you don't go to specific universities, are you a write-off? So what's no. your views on different, yeah, exactly. No, sorry, no. Different schools have different specialities. Um, people might say, oh, you know, Central St. Martins, da, da, da. But if I'm looking for somebody who's into lingerie and has got a background in technical apparel, uh, sports gear, then I'll be going to like London College of Fashion, De Montfort, Bournemouth. So we have that. But also, I'm a loser from Tasmania, right? <laughs> I'm from, I'm from here, from Nowheresville, and now I'm here speaking to creative directors, telling them what to do, um, dealing with people like Ollie and Lucy who are like high players in their games. So no, there you go. No, I don't know. I don't care what the other two say. I, I could not agree more. I think you need to show your personality with your portfolio. And that's, that's what I look for first. Yep. before I even look at a CV. So yeah, it's how you, and what you get the best out of that university you go to. Yeah. I'm clearly cannot shake my accent despite living abroad. And I studied in Newcastle and I've used every bit of that to my strengths. I, I would never turn a student down to look at them because they were from a certain university. I actually actively do the opposite because I just think if your work is strong enough, then it doesn't matter where you've learnt it as long as your work speaks for itself. What about Australians? Why not? Some of them are <laughs> not, right? <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, the next question is um, how to prepare for a group interview and what kinds of questions would you prepare for that? Group you might be the expert answerer on that on Lucy. I think at a graduate, if you're doing a group interview, that's that's tough. It's hard, yeah. <laughs> we we at PVH, we rarely do group interviews. We do peer conversations because we're unable to obviously fly people in, which is be where there'd be two people. But I would really push back if they say a group because I think it's really important that you feel that there's engagement there. And mm -hmm. if there's five people on a panel on a screen, and then there's you. 
I, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. So, um, but I, obviously if it's, we haven't been able to do any face-to-face -face interviews. Uh, I don't know how it is in the UK at the moment, if you can do those. No. Uh, oh, okay. So yeah, I think that you, I, I'll, you feel comfortable enough to say, actually a group interview maybe not might be the best way for me to present myself. Can I have at least one or two? People? You reckon? Oh, yeah. I didn't expect you to say that. What about you, Ollie? What do you think? I mean, I kind of would just reiterate, uh, reiterate what Lucy had said because I've personally have never been asked and have never asked for a group interview. Um, it's not that it, you know, is not good. It's just uh, if you're going to try and get a feeling of a candidate and how they work and give them time to express themselves, I don't think a group. Per it's just a personal thing, but I don't think a group interview is the correct way to get the most out of a person. Yeah, I had a group interview yesterday, actually, for something. I'm not leaving recruitment. Don't worry. <laughs> but I completely fluffed it because I didn't know whose energy to connect with and I didn't know who the boss of the conversation <laughs> was. So we can't actually give good advice by the sounds of that of how to cope. Yeah, I think. I... Oh, sorry, you go, Lucy. I think if you're presenting, I think you should be able to present your projects to two people. But you can also, it's okay to say no, because it also shows that you're also thinking about how to best present yourself. So I wouldn't mind presenting my portfolio and my projects to three three times to two different people each time. Mm -hmm. So just because someone says, oh, we have to present to 15 people, you can also say no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, would agree. Yeah. Sorry, Judith, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, not at all, not at all. Um, so just a quick one from me. I'm going to, um, I can see a couple more questions come in. Just your thoughts in terms of gimmick CVs and how you get your CV noticed. Thoughts, recommendations of what not to do, like having them self-combust or printed on toilet paper or whatever. Well, you can see by their faces, maybe you don't have to say anything, but. Yeah. Don't put pictures of your work on a CV. It's such a, it's such a personal thing, isn't it? Because those, is gonna... those icons and stuff make it look like a pizza menu or something of how, <laughs> or, you know, like how spicy food is or something. You know what I mean? It just looks super trashy. And from my experience, the more, um, the more elevated candidates in terms of experience or the industry in which they're working with, They've got the clearest, most simple CVs. And I always recommend that candidates go and have a look at online or the hard copy magazine and look at the font they use and look at the layout. And that is how you should be marketing yourself in a CV. But if you put a lot of like all pictures everywhere and all this graphic design and I can't even read it properly and the font too small, then I'm not going to read it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I also just think it's really so I'm looking for a couple of graphic designers at the moment and I can tell just by opening the screen if they're a graphic designer or not <laughs> I'm like oh my god no close <laughs> so I think simplicity is the best for me yeah yeah people have to remember pardon factual that's yeah. really important because you don't know no, and also if I'm looking for your handwriting and personality, I'll see that in your portfolio. Yeah. I, don't, I don't, the amount of also really bizarrely the same, even though they're so extrovert, some of the CVs, the same ones, like the same layouts and the same yeah. amounts of scissors for how good they are on Photoshop or Illustrator or, or you know, just I don't. Well, yeah that's the pizza menu stuff I yeah. <laughs> or when people say like how good they are at photoshop and they've got the dots and then they put five dots for how good they are i would expect someone to be able to write the software if they're five <laughs> you're, be better, you're better off just saying excellent at retouching or image whatever it is you're good at you're better off saying it Anyway. Can I ask, one of the questions that have come through is where to send your portfolio, to the design team direct or via HR? So I'm obviously part of HR uh, and we also have GDPR as well. Uh, so we have to be cautious of that. 
Um, GDPR, for people who don't know, is... Data protection. Yes, yeah, your data protection. So you need to be giving permission or you need to have permission to keep people's work and CVs on file. Yeah. So for I me, um, I'm going to be honest, my inbox explodes. So I would prefer for people to actually apply via a tracking system. And then we pull and you've also given us permission to re use and repurpose your CVs. So for example, if somebody is really strong in women's wear, but we have a men's wear, we can pull that to the women's wear profiles that we have. And your tracking systems through the, the website for PVH careers pages. Yeah. And yeah. I think also, um, I think some people do, especially if you've done an internship with us, you can have that connection. So yes, feel free to reach out to your mentor with your updated book. We would obviously love to come and view your graduate portfolio help help you do that but uh, I think sometimes it can get lost um I think I get on average four or five hundred emails a day so yeah. I, I don't think I could yeah spot a who a good book out of that and a large corporation like yours will have a relationship with someone like me a, a, a recruitment company and we would then have in our contract, it would be I'd be managing a role exclusively. So Lucy might say to me, oh, OK, we're going to be doing a women's outerwear designer and Denza are going to handle it for me. If anybody sends anything to Lucy directly or sends anything to the designers directly, it all has to come back to me anyway. So you might think, oh, you're going to do yourself a favour by like sneaking a CV in somewhere. It actually doesn't help. You either have, you have to go through the bot the proper channels. And can I ask? Someone's asked about if you've brought a physical portfolio with you. Is it normal to leave it with the company, or can you take it home? I think people are just thinking about the cost and uh, obviously other issues that might arise from that. Thoughts? Um, I would not be leaving my portfolio with the company. Never. <laughs> just, Don't even let them take it out of the room. No. Correct. Yeah. It's your work. It's your portfolio. Yeah. And if they're asking to keep it, why? That's yeah. a bit Don't be afraid to ask those yeah. questions because they really need... Really good to point. Yeah. And um, someone's written anonymously. Let me try this question because I'm not sure if I've misunderstood. We might need to get them to repost it. If you complete a design task for a role after attending an interview but then receive a no from the employer, what's your best advice? Oh, so they've done a project, but it didn't fit the brief, or they've decided to pursue another, yeah. Yeah. another profile. Yeah, so, and I'm not sure if they're asking about getting the work back, or, or I, I, I'm not quite sure what the purpose of the question is. But anyway, let me know your thoughts. So, so I can only speak on my, my behalf, but we always give feedback, either over the phone, if they're not based in the Netherlands, or via the agency. So I would never send a rejection email to somebody who's done a project you've built okay. that relationship already we would never ask for you to deliver your project to us anyway so you should never be asking it back for it because it's, it's your work so i think that you need to be um yeah you need to um sorry uh what was i saying i've lost the basically basically if somebody is going to cool. deliver a project to you at the moment, it's going to be presented anyway on the screen. So you're not physically hanging on to it. Um, if you're released after the process, a good company will have feedback for you as to why the project was not a success. Sometimes you would do it directly, but sometimes it comes through me. So a company like Lucy, for example, she would say, OK, we didn't select this profile because of reason A. We've selected the other profile, though, because of reason B then I would get back to the candidate and I would say to them, I'm really sorry, um, your project wasn't ex accepted for whatever reason, A, B, C. And I can only say to candidates that don't lose heart. It's sometimes not even personal or it could not even be down to the project. It could just be there was you and somebody else who didn't need relocating or something really, really simple. I don't, I don't know if I'm explaining it very well. The role could also go and hold. Oh, yes. That happens a lot, especially in these, in these times. Yeah. yeah. 
or an internal person has taken that opportunity because we also promote internal mobility within PVH and therefore then we and you're too senior to backfill or don't have the right experience to backfill. Yeah. Um, I can also say that we at Denza we only work with candidates that we could probably handle working with ourselves so if somebody annoys me for whatever reason and I think they're not going to be a reliable candidate I won't be working with them. And it's the same with clients as well. If I feel like they're not going to be treating candidates with respect or it's not somewhere where I would want to work myself, um, then I wouldn't be working with them either. So if I've got a client just asking people to do projects willy-nilly and there isn't a role, I see that as really disres disrespectful to the candidates as well. There are some companies who will ask for projects all over the place, but don't have a role. Um, unfortunately, if you're being approached directly, it's very hard for you to navigate. I don't know if we're answering this question very well. It's kind of like going down a rabbit hole <laughs> of, of all the, all the it's, it's one that there's no like real concrete answer for. Yeah. No, I think bottom line is if they're a respectable company and a good enough company, they would give you some form of feedback as to why you haven't been. So even if it's just an explanation of the role has been filled or, you know, it's that it has been put on hold or there are certain reasons I would, I, me and myself with dealing with those candidates, I've gotten back to them and I've taken my time to make the edit before requesting um, briefs done for specifically for us so it's not a large amount of people so I yeah. can take the time to get back to those people if they aren't successful yes thanks uh, for organizing my mind Ollie you're right because normally it is isn't it the first interview setting a project which will only be a small selection yeah um and frankly there's been very few times in my career doing this where companies have actually been asking for just like general projects. Mm -hmm. I'm aware that Lucy has to disappear off onto another call. So thank you, Lucy, if you have to disappear, you yeah. do what you need to do, because yeah. I appreciate you've got a hard stop. Yeah, sorry. Um, no, no, not at all, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lucy. Really. Bye, bye. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time. I mean, this has been brilliant as ever. It's a joy, Emma, <laughs> and thank you. Uh, thank you, Oliver, for, for, for sharing your insights as well. We really, really appreciate um, everything that you've, you've done for us. So um, just to let everyone know that obviously, please do, we put the link into the portfolios for Graduate Preview Day, right, Emma? Everyone should have a look at those. Oh my gosh, yes. Absolutely incredible. Ivan said, Ivan said thanks. Thanks, Ivan. Thanks for joining. I've got a, I've got a You're my bro. Thanks. <laughs> and we've put in the link to the next session, um, which is with Daniel Peters. So love you to join us um, at 2.15 um, for that. Um, but in the meantime, good luck, everyone, with your job searching. Any final thoughts, Emma? I'm going to say thanks to Ivan again for the high five and the fist bump. Oh, even better. <laughs> <laughs> anyone if anyone else wants to wave at us feel free to in the chat <laughs> oh yeah sarah lees you too <laughs> brilliant well thank you everyone really really appreciate it it's been great hanging out with you thanks for all that advice we appreciate it thanks, oh, thanks for inviting us have a great afternoon yeah you too hope to see you soon in real life oh gosh can't wait <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks. See you later, guys. Bye, everyone.